a one half i omega squared. And there wasn't any kind of sliding or rubbing going on, so I'll throw heat out of the equation. And so I don't want to go too far with this because this is really as far as your author goes. I don't even know if your author quite goes this far, but your author just wants to point out, and this is what I want to point out, is there's not much more to add to this when you do rotations other than to say, Use the principle of conservation of energy that we learned in chapter 7, but expand it by including one more form or flavor of kinetic energy, one half mv squared. And so, so that's what I, what I did, because the potential energy, kinetic energy, we already talked about in chapter 7. But what I'm adding here is at the bottom of the hill, it's not just translating, it's rotating. In fact, if I do a little bit of math, you can see that the radius of the object and the mgr is on both sides of this equation. So, making it look a little bit simpler to understand, we could say, cancel those off, and then the thing that's relevant is really the, the height of the incline. And so it does boil down to just really what's the height of the incline because the extra distance to the center of mass shows up on, on both sides of the equation and they, they just cancel off. So had I forgot about the center of mass, I guess I would have been okay, but I, I didn't want to skip over that. I wanted to, to make sure that you, you, you see that I'm thinking about the uh, center of mass. But what I want you to see in here, even if we don't solve it all the way, is this. That here is simply what this equation is saying is if we sit back and we kind of analyze these numbers. I like to use the phrase if we read the math instead of actually doing the math. But here's what it's saying. It says as it goes down the hill, this potential energy is going to become kinetic energy. But it's two types of kinetic energy. And so if I take two different objects, like the disk going down, versus the hoop going down. Both of these objects then, as they go down the hill, would be, if I can use the word, releasing the same amount of gravitational potential energy, mgh. They have the same mass and they go down the same height. Okay. Then that energy goes where? Well, it goes to kinetic, but look at this carefully. Look at this in an interesting way. Those two objects do not have the same rotational inertia. Remember we said the hoop has a slightly bigger moment of inertia. And so what that implies then is that this number here is going to be bigger for the hoop than for the disk. Which then also means that this number then is going to be smaller for the hoop. Because remember these two have to add up to the same number. Uh, let me give an example. Let, let's say this is your income for the month. And let's say your income for the month is $500. Okay, so here's $500. Now, if your share of the rent is $400, then you only have $100 for groceries. But if your share of the rent is $300, then you would have more for groceries. You would have $200. And that's what we see here, is that as this rolls down the hill, these two objects, the release of the energy is the same. Let me just call it 500. But for this one, this one's got to pay 400 for rent. But, but, but this one only has to pay 300 for rent. Which means this one has more of this, 200, compared to this one, which only has 100. 
So this one has more of this, which, which is the translational kinetic energy. It's how fast is it going? And so that would tell me by using energy methods that this one should be going faster than that one. And so it's the same conclusion we got when we just looked at the moment of inertia. If we look at the energy, we would say the same thing that, okay, I put these both on here. And as I put them on there and let them roll down to the bottom, there's going to be a release of the same amount of energy. But to get the hoop to rotate takes more energy than the disc. So the disc is going to have more translational kinetic energy. And this one will have less translational kinetic energy. Because this one, hoop, has more rotational kinetic energy. And so that would tell me that the disk is going to be going faster. It has more translational kinetic energy. So one, two, three, let it go. Yep, and sure enough, there it is again. The disk wins the race. So that's where this idea of translational kinetic energy can be very powerful. And when we apply it to conservation of energy, we get some predictable re re results here. And so I should probably just point out that it's an energy, so it too is measured in joules. So that's the thing about chapter 7. There's not, like I said, much to add. I'm just going to say, take all those wonderful things that we learned in chapter 7 about conservation of energy, and then just throw in one more piece if it is rotating. And so now, let's go to the last parallel here. So we better wrap this up. And that is the chapter 6. And if you remember, chapter 6 had to do with momentum. Uh, we didn't really call it linear momentum too often, but we should have. And so I guess I will now. And so momentum, MV, um, is what I will call then linear momentum. And let me come back over here and put it in my chart. And so my chart P for momentum is MV. And the units were the kilogram meter per second. And a very important principle of chapter 6 was the conservation of momentum. Uh, now I should probably call it conservation of linear or translational momentum. Because we then are going to have a parallel to that. Uh, we will call this a rotation or an angular momentum. And the definition of it, and the symbol is L, but the definition is a lot like what we see between force and torque. So I'll come back over here and say it again. Torque and force are not the same thing. Torque is two pieces. It's force and the distance or the lever arm. And I'm going to say the same thing here with our angular momentum. Uh, it is the linear momentum or translational momentum with the distance involved. So if I reach back into my box here and grab this ball with a string on it again and hold it and kind of spin it in a circle here. And so of course we're, we're going in a circle. I might say, what is the angular momentum of this? And then in this case, the R would be this distance, in this case the radius at which it is going around. And I 
probably didn't give myself quite enough room. Usually we write the MV first and then the R. Of course, it doesn't matter what order, but I'll follow your book. And so your author is saying this is MVR. And so there would be the angular mo momentum. And of course, as you'll see, the important part of angular momentum, just like the important part of linear or translational momentum, was that we had this conservational principle. And so what I want to show you here as we wrap up this chapter is this is a very useful definition too because then we have our third and final conservational principle of mechanics. We're going to call it conservation of, of angular momentum. But before I get that far, I might ask, well, what are the units here? And maybe you can uh, see that that the first two would have the same units as here, the kilogram meter per second. And then this extra distance R would just be another meter. And so this would be a kilogram, a meter squared over a second. And so that's the, the units for this thing called angular momentum. And of course, if you compare these two, you'll see that Angular momentum has the same units as linear momentum with an extra meter. And again, that's really the same thing between force and torque. Uh, force had units of newtons, and torque then had a newton times a meter. It was the original unit for force and then an extra meter. So that's what I, what I have here. Although I don't have a special name for it, like a joule or a newton. It's just, you know, the combination of those, those uh, uh, variables there. Now, it's also, and maybe I shouldn't have put a line here, because although that's true, it's also kind of nice to think about angular momentum with a little more parallelism back to here. See, right now, I would say the parallelism of this is really more of this parallelism. The step from force to torque was an extra distance. All right, so the step from linear momentum to angular momentum was this extra distance. But if we think about angular momentum the same way we, we thought about here, we could say that, okay, what would replace mass would be rotational inertia. And what would replace translational velocity would be angular velocity. And so we would get the I omega equals the angular momentum. And so angular momentum is a little more advanced than, say, the kinetic energy. That's why I wanted to do the kinetic energy before the angular momentum. That's why I want to do chapter 7 before chapter 6. Is because we kind of have these two options that we can look at it. We could look at it really as a linear motion with a distance, or we can look at it as a spin. And so this, you know, is helpful uh, in some problems to think of it as, well, it's just a regular moving object, but it goes in a circle, so it has a radius. Or we could say it's an object that's spinning, okay, and then that's where that one would come in. And so sometimes one is better than the, the other, and so we, we have both, and so I wanted to show you uh, both. In fact, I'll do some experiments uh, with you, because the, the big and final piece, really, of this chapter is really the conservation of angular momentum. Uh, if you remember, back in chapter 6, we said this, that the change in linear momentum, of course, back then we just called it momentum, is equal then to the net force multiplied by time. And then we said, if you didn't have any forces, and I should say net force. So in other words, if you had an interaction between two objects, if you included both objects, the forces were equal and opposite. That is, one lost momentum and the other gained momentum. 
then we could say the change in momentum is zero. And so when we looked at the two objects together, we said there would not be a change in momentum of the, of the total two objects. Of A uh, fancy word there is, we wouldn't see a change in the, uh, the momentum of the, the system. And so we did a bunch of problems this way. We said, hey, when you collide, you have the uh, momentum before equals the momentum after. Uh, which, by the way, uh, the lab we did yesterday, and I, I, I sent the, the links to you, um, and then I noticed that the, the sound was bad, so I also sent an email that said, oh, sorry about the, the, the sound, and uh, meant uh, failure. But we fixed that. That's the good news. Uh, we shot some more video and uh, edited it this morning, and right now it's processing, uh, and I've got being shot up to YouTube uh, right now. It'll take a while to get on YouTube and then they've got to do their uh, processing and also their copyright check and all that stuff. Um, in fact, it's probably done already. Um, I just got to get over to the computer. Uh, anyways, that's a long way of, uh, of saying here if, if uh, you don't want to look at those uh, links and try to figure out the lab, I get that. Uh, that's why I'm going to give you a better one here and so just takes a while to get everything uh, going here and so sometime hopefully by noon today uh, you'll see an email from me that has that link and you can start working on it we won't be done filming our, our labs or lectures uh, uh, at that time and so you won't get a, a link from me for today until you know in the afternoon like you usually do three or, or, or four o'clock here so Oh, and while I'm bringing it up, um, I'm going to add to that email. Uh, now that we're done with test one, you're probably curious about test two. So test two is, is coming up. It's not this Monday, but the, the following Monday. Okay. Um, and it is chapters uh, seven, eight, and then we're going to go 11, 12, and 13. And we're just going to have the same structure. I think that worked well. Um, and uh, I'm just going to add to your Canvas page uh, the labs. So if you've already done the lab, you don't have a place to turn it in quite yet, so I apologize for that. I need to get that going to you. If you've done the homework already for Chapter 7, again, I haven't given you a spot to, to turn that in. But none of that's going to be due until test day. And so let's just go for two more weeks, and on the next test, we'll have you turn in your homework, 7, 8, 11, 12, and 13. Um, and then we'll also have you do the uh, labs. Uh, and I won't count them out, but whatever labs were from the last test to the next test. Um, and then, of course, the test will be kind of the, the same structure where you'll start it at 11 o'clock on Monday. In fact, I should just pick the date here, uh, get it in my head. It looks like the, the 15th. And so Monday the 15th would be that uh, second test at 11 o'clock. So plan your calendars accordingly and it'll be the same structure. I'll give you from 11 to 12.30 to take the test and then give you 15 minutes to scan it and upload it. And so the shutoff time will be that 12.45 again. All right, back to finishing up this chapter. And so let me say it again. In chapter 6, we had a very, very important and powerful principle that the momentum before equals the momentum after. And that was kind of like this chart here where we could do, and I'll just make a new chart here, but we could say then that if you figure out what is the angular momentum before, uh, it must be the same as after. And we would put that in equation form like this. The, the change in angular momentum would be the net torque multiplied by time. So if you had two objects so that the net torque is zero, the change in angular momentum would be zero. And so this is probably best illustrated with actually making two objects come together. That's what this stool is out here for. Uh, you'll see that I have one disc that I can spin. And I guess I have a second one, which I could spin also, but I'll just hold it uh, stationary. 
And so I hope what you are seeing now is I have one moving and one stationary. Now let me stop this for a second because when we did chapter 6, I did exactly the same thing. It was right here on the end of the table. I had a track with two carts. And I had one cart that was stationary and then I pushed the first one. So the first one was moving and the second one was stationary. And, and, and that's what I'm going to say here. I have one moving and one stationary. And we did a bunch of different problems when we did our translational momentum. But one of them was the Velcro. That is, we made them come and they stuck together and they went moving along. And so if I take these two discs and I spin one, so one's moving and the other one's not, and then I put them together, now I don't really have Velcro here, but I do have a rough piece of wood. And so I can put them together like this. Let me get it right over the center line. And so now they stick together. And now they spin. See, and we could ask this question, how fast is it spinning now? And just like the one with the Velcro stuck together, we had two carts of the same mass, and we said the speed is half. Because if you remember, I pushed it with my hand, it was going four, and then they stuck together, and so the speed afterwards was a speed of two. Now, I could do the same thing. So let's start here, and let me give this a speed of four again. So this has a speed of four. This has a speed of zero. I put them together. What is the speed now that they stuck together? And I claim it's two. Well, watch, you can see this in the math. So let me grab my marker, let me come over to here. So before I put them together, if I went to calculate the angular momentum, I would say it is the I of the first one, the omega of the second one, the I of the second one, and then the omega of the second one. So before I put them together, I'll just call this I, and then I said that the speed of the first one was four, and the second one I was holding in my hand, so it had a speed of, of zero. And so that just comes out to be 4i. Now, I didn't even give you a number for what i is. Uh, I could, uh, but it's one, as you're going to see, it's not necessary. Uh, you might remember from yesterday's lecture, it would be some number in kilogram meters uh, squared. And we use this disk in our, our lab class, and so that number I know well. I think it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it is. It's 6 times 10 to the minus 2 kilogram meters squared. But let me not worry about the, the number. All you need to know is that if this moment of inertia or rotational inertia of this one and this one are the same, then on this side of the equation, when they stick together, where I might write it as I1 omega 1 plus I2 times omega 2. But if they stick together, this would just be I omega, and this would also be I omega. So again, notice the same I as over here. And then also, since they stuck together, I would just say their omegas are the same. So this would come out to be 2 I omega. And this is the part that I was saying. It, it, we don't really need to know what the the value is, if they're the same, they would combine together and then cancel on both sides. And so then I get my omega of 2. And so that's how I got the angular speed of 2. Now I noticed I was a little careful with, or careless with my, my units. I said it was 4, and if we go all the way back to yesterday's lecture, for what? Uh, RPMs, uh, degrees per second, I guess we could even do radians per second. Since your book does a lot of RPM stuff, why don't I say it was RPMs? So this really should be two RPMs which would be two revolutions per minute, and obviously <laughs> I spun it a lot faster than that. But if I had, that's what it would have come out to be. So maybe I should have picked a bigger number like 400 RPMs or something. But I just wanted you to, to see that this parallelism, and I'll say it again because 
these problems can be a little challenging when we get into rotation. And I think the best way, and maybe even the only way, to do this chapter, because we're doing so much, everything that we've done for translational motion, in the first seven chapters we're repeating here, and there, that's so much, that I think the only way you can digest it within, you know, one day is, and if this was a semester long, I would say one week, but still that's a short amount of time, is to see the parallelism. And uh, there are a few things then that are even harder, which is the step up between force to torque and the step up between mass and moment of inertia. And even as you're going to see here, this step up between momentum and angular momentum. Because here's another fun one to do with conservation of angular momentum. And so again, this is our third and final conservational principle before we leave mechanics. But let me emphasize that you're going to want to, like I did with conservation of linear momentum in chapter 6, and I also did with conservation of energy in chapter 7, here in chapter 8, when you have two things interacting, that's a clue. Oh, momentum. But since they're spinning or rotating, it's angular momentum. And so I just make this little chart. Anytime I do these conservational principles, I just do this little chart here. And so this little chart is putting the angular momentum on this side and then afterwards on that side. And uh, I was just looking, Ron, did, did the, is the uh, transmitter plugged in the, to the phone? Yeah, okay. It, it didn't look like it from, from here. Okay. Um, and so then let's try a second option. And, and here's a kind of a fun one to do. Let me just kind of move this stool out of the way. Uh, I'll take this hammer off here. But if I take this stool, this is one I can sit on. And so you can see it, 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 it spins and spins real, real nice. And if the object spinning is me, and I make my arms kind of heavy, so I'll just kind of hold these in here, I could hold these weights out here or in here. And the reason that's relevant here is because when I get on this stool and I start spinning, and so I'll just kick the ground and give myself a little spin, I would say that I have some angular momentum. Now I don't have two objects so I'm not going to bother to say plus, I'm just going to put a little sub i to say this is my initial. But if I pull my arms in that would change my rotational inertia. And the reason I said angular momentum was more interesting and more complex than linear momentum was because of that, that statement of pulling my arms in. You see, when it came to translational or linear momentum, it doesn't matter if my arms are out or in, I still have the same mass. Nothing interesting changed there. But for angular momentum, this is kind of interesting because by pulling my arms in, this number here goes down. So in order to have the same angular momentum, my angular speed must go up. And so, even though I'm not dealing with a second object, my speed can increase or decrease, and it must increase or decrease in order to keep the angular momentum uh, the same here. And so, if I take these weights and sit on this stool, let me put one foot on here, let's see, make sure I'm not going to hit anything, okay. And I give myself a little nudge, okay, 
I can go around and I'd say I'm going around at a pretty slow speed but if I bring my arms in I go faster or if I bring my arms out I go slower faster slower faster slower and so using this principle of conservation of angular momentum and the fact that the rotational inertia is a bit more complicated that is the rotational inertia depends not only on the mass but also where the mass is located and in this case I could just move my arms in and out by changing that I change the rotational inertia which then the corresponding speed has to change and so that's I think a more interesting effect and something we couldn't see with just translational uh, momentum we couldn't really change the mass but here with rotational uh, momentum we, we we can and so hopefully you saw when my arms came in so this went down my my speed went up it's really no different than this kind of little low-tech simple gadget but it's kind of fun to see if I take this and it's just a real a, a small glass tube uh, with a string and a small weight tied to the end and if you give it uh, a little spin to get it started and so maybe you'll say okay there's a uh, I'll just call that a low speed right now let me I'll let it slow down a little bit whoops maybe right about there but then if I pull the string in, you'll see it really picks up its, its angular speed. And that's just conserving angular momentum. And so here it's got an angular momentum, and here it's got a low speed but a big distance. And then as I pull this in, it now has a small distance and a big speed. And, and that one might be better to then see in the math in this form because if I were to make a well I'll just extend it onto this chart here uh, maybe I would say that spinning uh, weight that rubber stopper would be M initial V initial R initial that would then equal to M final V final R final and of course in this case the actual M the mass of that rubber stopper doesn't change as I pull it in so I'll just cancel that off but what we see here is if you take the starting velocity the initial velocity and the initial radius and then you take the radius and you make it go down then the speed has to go up in order to keep the angular momentum the same and so notice I'm solving this problem or discussion I'm not really calculating anything but you will be asked to do some calculations by using this principle of conservation of angular momentum so make yourself a little chart the key though is to recognize you know when am I supposed to use conservation of angular momentum and the best thing I can say is the same parallelism in that I said in chapter 6 if you've got two things interacting in this case if you've got two things that are interacting that are spinning that are rotating then know that the angular momentum before equals the angular momentum after but they don't even have to be two objects as you can see it could be just one object where the weight changes and so that's the this the whole idea here uh, this one was actually two objects uh, let me do another two uh, uh, two object one here uh, let me make a little chart and do the the same thing let me put here a uh, before and let me put here an after uh, and let me take two objects so I'll put I1 omega 1 plus I2 omega 2 and we can do this in a lot of different ways why don't I just start this I'm going to take two objects both of them are stationary so I would have I1 times 0 and then I2 times 0 which means I've got <laughs> a total of 0 angular momentum and I hope what you're about to see looks a lot like we did in chapter 6 if you remember in chapter 6 I took two carts I put a plunger between them and I put them together and I just left them there and I said okay here is two carts at rest their total momentum right now is zero but when I pushed down and released the plunger one went to the left and one went to the right 
so that the momentum total was still zero. One had positive momentum and the other one had negative momentum. We see that with spinning objects. If you start with two objects and neither one is spinning, what would happen then if you forced one of them to spin, let's say, in a clockwise direction? And hopefully you'll see that if I grab a spinny object. Here's a nice object. And it's kind of a heavy object, and so I'll use this one. You can see I've added weights on the perimeter of this so that it's kind of heavy. Because the other object's going to be me, and I'm definitely heavy, and I'm going to sit on this stool. And so if I sit on the, the stool here, and it's almost impossible not to move. Ouch. Almost impossible to uh, not move at all. But I will try, and hopefully at least I will be barely moving. So I'm going to hold this maybe above my head so you can see it. And then I'm going to lift my foot up. And after I lift my foot up, I'm going to take this wheel with my hand and I'm going to spin it. And so it's going to spin like this. And so you kind of have to imagine you're up here on the ceiling looking down. And if you look at that, you'll see that this object, let's call this object number one, and I'll be number two. But this object is number one. This object is going to be spinning, if you're looking from down, from, a, from the ceiling, that would be uh, clockwise. And so this is going to be clockwise. And guess what will happen to me? I will go counterclockwise. Because we have to be equal angular momentums, but opposite. Okay, so here we go. So, I'll hold it up here, and then I'll spin it. Yep, and sure enough, I go clockwise. Now, watch this. What if I, so I spin it, and remember it goes clockwise, so I'm going counterclockwise. Our total angular momentum is zero, right? Remember.